I don't care how this sounds, it's true. In film, the director fires the writer. In television, Absolutely. the writer fires the director. That's why a lot of writers in film want to be directors too. It's yes. not because they want to actually be the director, they just want to have control. They want to see their creative vision come yes. to life, which is not what happens when you write a movie for somebody else. Pleasure to see you. Oh, happy to be here. Thank you for coming on the show. You are a true maverick. You actually should have the name, not me. <laughs> no, thanks for inviting me. I'm excited. It's a huge honor and a pleasure to spend time with you. Um, I'm a huge fan. From what I understand as a kid, you were always had an imagination and yes. dreaming and thinking of things since you can remember. Yeah, since I can remember. I mean, it really, I tell the story in my book, but it really started out with me as a kid in our pantry, in our small kitchen. I was like three or four, and I would play with the cans in the pantry. Like they had- And make them characters and They things? had personalities and characters. The little <laughs> cans were like the the kids or the, the people who were like working low, and the big cans were more important as we went on. And my mom would um, sort of say, like, oh, she'd open the pantry and say like, I, I need something to cook, like I need some vegetables. <laughs> and I would have to decide like who was gonna die <laughs> so okay, that she yes. could cook some dinner. Wow, yeah. that's it. And your mom and dad let you just, they let you run wild with your imagination. I feel really lucky that I had parents who were just completely comfortable with this is who she is. You know, they never told me to get out of the pantry. Sometimes she'd make me go outside, but I would just go outside with a book. Mm -hmm. um, but I was that kid and that's who I was and they were really supportive. Only child? No, I'm the youngest of six. Oh, you're the youngest? Yeah. So your siblings would not join in these games with you? No, they wouldn't at all, <laughs> at all. And some of my siblings were much, much older and I think what they provided was this example of like what I could do, but my mom let everybody, my parents let everybody do sort of what made sense for them. Oh, that is amazing. Yeah. And you built the whole Shonda land then. I kind of did, yeah. The idea that there was like a land inside my head was always there. And when you write now or come up with characters, do you, because I tell people like, I'm a cyclist. I like to ride, I cycle all the time this weekend I'll be. And when I get on a, every time I get on a bike, no matter how many times I do it, the first hour of my bike ride, I feel the most childlike again. It's something oh, about the wind on my face and the the first time I was ever free, mm -hmm. right? You were, mm -hmm. I, my mom, I remember, would sit on our porch and she'd let me go on the bike and she'd say, just come around the block. But I felt like I could just go anywhere. Do you still feel that childlike feeling when you write now? That's a really good way of putting it. I never thought of it that way. But I am the most at peace. I am the calmest. I am the happiest. I. I don't know, I have the most fun when I'm writing. When you're writing. Yeah. Yeah, and and I imagine, yes, you go back to almost being in the pantry again. Because, right, because you're, you're back, you're just back in your head. Right. And physically, you could be anywhere, but that feeling must, feel, that sensation must come back over you. That feeling comes every time. And it's that thing of, you know, my little cans used to have conversations and I would say them all aloud. <laughs> I say all the dialogue aloud and I act all the scenes out <laughs> while I'm writing. And it's so much fun. It just is. We all talk to ourselves. Mm -hmm. I talk to myself nonstop yeah. every day. It's just I'm conscious enough when I'm out in the public or out with people, my mouth isn't moving. But in the house by myself, I oftentimes do talk to whatever is going on in my head. But it's interesting you do it to create an output as a as a writer. And were you did you go to like training for writing or did you just um, and when did you first start actually writing these things down that were in your head? I think I started writing like there was a period of time when I was saying stories into um, tape recorders and then trying to get my mom to type them up. And then how old were you then? Maybe five or six. Wow. Yeah. And then after that, I started writing. I would write in my journal and I would write all these crazy stories in my journal. My sister and I would come up with crazy like plays that we would record into the tape recorder as well and thought that we thought that was really amazing. And then I think I got serious in high school. You know, there was a moment when I was young when we gave my dad some really big holiday present. I'm not even sure I remember what it was, mm -hmm. but I wrote a poem to present it. Wow. And seeing the reaction to the poem that I read was, it was incredible. It was one of those moments where I was like, oh, I think I can write. Like, it was that moment. When you first started out writing, what did you want to write? I mean, in the beginning, I wanted to be Toni Morrison. I really thought I was going to be this, like, deep novelist writing about, like, deeply amazing things and, I don't know, winning a Nobel Prize in literature, which can't happen because that's Toni Morrison's job. <laughs> but also just, I thought, I thought novelist was what it was going to be, and it just 
I just wasn't interested. It was interesting. I would really? lose. I would write stories and I would lose interest. I would write stories and I would lose interest. You weren't interested, meaning to take it all the way through and finish yes, it. Yes, exactly. And then I went to film school, and I thought I was just going to write movies. Like I thought, is that's where it was at at the point? You know, television hadn't had its big explosion, so I was like, I'm going to write movies, and I did. I wrote some teen girl movies, and I wrote introducing Dorothy Dandridge, and it was fun, but I wasn't loving it. What's the reason you weren't loving it? So I don't. I mean, I don't care how this sounds. It's true. In, in film, the director fires the writer. In television, Absolutely. the writer fires the director. Absolutely, and it that's wasn't, true. <laughs> it's not just that piece, but it was the creative control. That's why a lot of writers in film want to be directors too. It's yes. not because they want to actually be the director. They just want to have control. They want to see their creative vision come yes. to life, which is not what happens when you write a movie for somebody else. Yeah. So for me, for television, it was great. I mean, I had to say what color someone's shoes were going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it was that minute and, and specific. Yes. And I love that. It's your idea. You want to see it come to life. Yeah, all the you've, life. you're world building. Yes. I and mean, that's the coolest thing. You're literally typing into your White House day and someone is building you an Oval Office. So you're world building, and that's there's nothing more fun than that. What was the goal and your intention when you first started writing uh, shows? You know, I wanted to write a show I wanted to watch. Like, at that point in time, there was not anything on television that felt like the women I knew or the people I knew, and I never saw myself on television in the right way. And I just wanted to write a show I wanted to watch. So the first show I wrote was Grey's Anatomy, which, right out of the box, there's that. So that really sort of changed the idea, and I, for a while you get nervous, thinking like, how am I gonna repeat this? Am I gonna repeat this? And then I just started to think, no, you just have to write another show you wanna watch. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to do it. That's amazing. So your first show is one of the greatest shows ever put on TV. Um, obviously been going forever. I can't imagine the pressure of that, to your point, it's like, you know, it's like Michael, you know, making Off the Walls his first solo album. It's like, how do you live? Did it ever get to the point where you're like, where you were actually nervous to write a second show? Because like, how is it going to be? How am I ever going to beat that or even get close to that? Did you ever feel like it was actually stopping you from going forward? For a while, I think what kept me going was the idea that I didn't feel secure. Like everybody else would say it was a success. And I was like, I get fired any minute. I don't know how this is going to work. Like I was still clipping coupons yeah. for a long time. <laughs> and so I was like, I better write another show. And then I think I did Scandal. And after Scandal, it felt like maybe the greatest moments of your career might be behind you. Like, just what are you going to do next? And that was a real feeling that pervaded everything. So when did you actually feel like, oh, I'm a successful writer, I know how to write shows? Because you said you didn't feel that way when Grey's Anatomy was going, but when did you get there? Not that long ago, I will say. I was being inducted into the Television Academy Hall of Fame by Oprah Winfrey. And that literal moment, <laughs> while it was happening, I turned to my daughter and I said, we've made it. And that was a moment, the only moment I'd ever felt like, okay, I can relax. Wow. Because until then, you know, I don't know, I'm a black girl from the south, south suburbs of Chicago. Like, you want to make sure you got something going. You want to take care of your family. You want to be successful. Like, for me, it was really important to be successful. And I was not going to rest on that at any point. Being that black woman from the south side of Chicago, did you feel like when you first went in with Grey's Anatomy and then you had Grey's Anatomy, did you feel some resistance to what you wanted to do or who you are or the type of people you want to see on TV? It was interesting because nobody at ABC said, we're not going to do this show with this multiracial cast in this way. Nobody said that. But I did get a lot of, these aren't real women. Like, these women aren't women that people should be watching on television because they were competitive, they weren't always nice. You know, they were, they were to me, real women. And for them, that was a problem. Essentially, you were kind of breaking rules and changing things. Everybody talked about it. You had no idea. I don't think I'd watched enough television to really understand it completely. I just knew that the stuff I was watching didn't feel like the women I knew. And I wanted to write about women who were really competitive at work, who, you know, did all the things that you saw male characters do, but you never saw women do on television. So you like a study television, study characters, or you, or you just make up the characters you want to see? I just think of the characters I want to see. That doesn't mean that I have not been a student of television as, you know, as the years went by. One of the reasons I got into television was because I had a baby and suddenly you're at home with a baby, you can't really go anywhere. <laughs> so I started watching all this television and realized that that's where all the real character development was happening. Like I saw, you know, the first season of 24 and 24 hours and I watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer and all these other shows, but realizing like this is where real character development could happen and sort of discovering how it was happening on those shows was interesting. Wow, so the baby, 
gets credit for, the, for, you, the for all the shows credit. we love. That's yes. right. <laughs> then, so you write these shows. Now, all of a sudden, you go from being a writer, right? Not go from being a writer. You're still a writer, but then you have all these other responsibilities, right? Yes. From making shows, running a business, Sean. But what part of that was the hardest for you? Like when you're like, shit, I used to just write shows and come up with worlds. I still got to do that and all of this and all and 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 and. I think the leadership, like becoming a leader, really a leader, because you can sit in your little pantry and you can write and you can stick your head out and say it should go this way or this way, but you're really leading a group of people. And when you have a company, you're really leading a group of people. And I was not a natural leader at all. I was much more of an introvert. I was very uncomfortable with the position. And I think for me, that was the biggest learning curve was really figuring out how to be an effective leader and a supportive one versus saying like, we're all going to do everything my way, which is what happens when you make TV. <laughs> that's, that's a dictator. Yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. Being a dictator to actually being a leader who like brought people in and made people feel like they were a part of things and made sure that they had some stake in things too. And how did you learn that? How did you, what was your journey in that? Oh, wow. I spent, this is going to sound silly, but I spent a lot of time talking on the phone to my dad, who that was what he did. And then I read a lot of books. I mean, I read a lot of books and I- Like on leadership? Literally? Yeah, on leadership. I'd read a lot of books on leadership. And then I also just talked to other people in the business about, you know, just casually about how it was working for them and what they were doing. Because it was really important to me to figure out, like, I don't like to not be good at something. So it was really important to me to figure out how to be good at this. What did your dad do, by the way, when you were My dad was a chief information officer for universities, Got like it. Ohio Which State. Which is, what does that mean? It's like you're running the country that is the college. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So he was a leader. So he knew how to lead. Yes. He knew very how much to lead. So. And you talked to him about your struggles with leadership? I would call him all the time with questions and say, how do you do this? Or what do you do with this? He would recommend some books. He would talk me through things. It was great. Now, when you started running the company, you were you still are churning out hits. So it obviously didn't get in the way, right? It didn't get in the way of being still being Shonda the, with the great imagination and the mm -hmm. world builder. Because sometimes that can get in the way. Yeah. I think one of the things I tried hard to do was to bring in the people. When it started to feel hard, when it started to feel like, I don't know if I can do this anymore, and my writing, is my writing going to be as good? I really tried to bring in the people who could do those things. Somebody told me once, I think it was actually my dad, write a list of all the things that you do every day, cross out everything that somebody else can do, and then only do the things that are left. And that was really hard to do as a control freak, <laughs> um, but it actually like saved me, because what I realized is, is what they're paying me for, what people are, are here for, are the stories we're telling. They're not necessarily here for me running this meeting over here or me doing this thing over there. It was the stories we're telling, and I'm the steward of those stories. When did you get to the point where you could trust people with stories? Meaning, did you get to the point where like, okay, now I've created the world here. You can go write episodes and other. Um, it was the hardest to do with Grey's Anatomy because it was the first one. And so it took me, I want to say like almost 13 years to like wow. hand that over. And even though I was doing other shows, um, and then it became easier, I think. Like Scandal, we had a room that had been there forever. And so like, I knew those people. I never handed it over, but I also never created another show while we were doing Scandal. Like you I only did Scandal. I only did Scandal. How many years was that? Seven years. Got it. So, and that was, that was a big deal to not have made a new show in that period of time. And then when I moved to Netflix, what was great about that was just finding people, like I had people that I had worked with for years, bringing them along and going like, I believe in you and I believe in you and I know what you can do now. So letting them have their voices. Going from ABC to Netflix, that's a big change, mostly because you have been not constrained, but there are certain rules, a lot of rules on network TV versus Netflix, correct? Mm -hmm. So was that an adjustment for you? Like, oh, in a good way or a bad way? Or Going from ABC to Netflix was huge not necessarily because of the, the rules specifically, which there were some and that was, that was a challenge, but really we were breaking a model of television that hadn't been broken before. So now we were moving over to a streamer and we were making shows exclusively for a streamer, which that just hadn't been done. Never been done. So figuring out how to make shows within that structure. It's the difference between working for like a really old established company and then working for a startup. Yep, exactly. It's a completely different mentality, completely. And a completely different culture. There are great fences in network television that I enjoyed because I had to figure out how to get around them yeah. in a weird way. <laughs> and then to arrive at a place where like open field, whatever you want, it was almost too much. And we talked a lot at the beginning with everybody in my company about being really careful. Like we can do anything we want. So we should be really careful about what we're doing. How do you 
define or think about a Shondaland project? Like, if I was coming into Shondaland, me, Maverick, the picture show, what are the things you're looking for to go, okay, this is a Shondaland project? I think a lot of it is, you know, we like fearless storytelling. We don't go, it, it seems this way, but we don't go dark. Like the sort of, the idea of the dark, somber show with serious, serious, serious that sort of goes darker. We don't go dark. I always feel like there has to be some hope involved in there somewhere. Even if I'm talking about, you know, Kerry Washington beating a character over the head with a chair, there has to be some <laughs> light in there somewhere. And what is your vision for Shondaland? Like, what do you want Shondaland as a brand, as a company to be? What is, it's obviously made it, it's the company, but you made amazing, amazing shows and now building a world. What is your vision for it? You know, I really want to be thought of as a full storytelling company. So we're not just telling stories on television, we're telling stories in a lot of different ways. And those stories include the visions of our fans in the sense that they see themselves represented on our shows. Um, I don't know, you know, when I look forward, we're at this sort of amazing place and I've just had this big break because the strike happened. Um, but we're at this sort of amazing place where we can still do anything. And now it's less about should we do it, but where do we want to go? Mm -hmm. And so we've really been talking about that a lot. Like, where do we want to go in terms of our content for our shows? Where do we want to go in terms of what we're, what we're doing? And I think the best thing I can do is to have a world in which at some point somebody can say, there was a Shonda of Shondaland, so that the company can exist without me and be a storytelling engine for other writers as well. That's amazing. And what do you look for in other writers when you go out? Because you're one of the greatest writers to ever live. That must be hard. <laughs> I don't think I'm one of the greatest writers to ever live. I do. I say okay. You know, for me, I want a writer who has an opinion. I like people who aren't afraid to argue with me, but I also want someone to come in with a vision. And that vision isn't Shonda 2.0. That vision has to be like, I have a way of telling stories that matters to me. And you have to know who you are to do that. You really do. Or you have to be naive enough to not know, you know, all the challenges <laughs> exactly. that go with it. But I feel like when people come in and they really have a vision and a voice, like if somebody can really write, but not write like me, I get very excited about them. And do you have you ever met someone who can who has great stories in their head, but can't put it down on paper that well? And those, can you help them and train them? Well, those are called producers, I like to say. You know? <laughs> and it's true, producers have lots of great ideas, but they can't put them down on yes, paper. That's and me, if, I can't put it down. Right, and if you can't write, you can't write. So don't yes. call yourself a writer, that's yes. okay. Produce the heck out of something, and yes. I'm supportive of that. Thank you for taking what's in your head and giving it to the rest of us, <laughs> right? And sharing it, and not just keeping it in your pantry. Uh, for just your mom and siblings <laughs> to know about. And at Spring Hill, we have a line, our tagline is make it till you make it. Like it's yes. a play on obviously. But, and that idea of making something until you make it, obviously to your point, you sat there that moment with Oprah and told your daughter, what does that mean to you to make something and then have that thing that you make help you to make it? I don't know. It's a surreal and surprising thing because it only recently occurred to me that, that this is technically the definition of self-made. Like, truly, um, that, you know, I came from not anywhere in the business, didn't know anybody, and then I'm here, feels stunning and surprising to me, simply because all I was doing was telling stories I wanted to, to watch on TV. That feels amazing. But also to realize the, the breadth and success of it, and that there is actually a legacy in there somewhere, is, um, I don't know, sometimes it's overwhelming. So when you think about, like, obviously the company grows, and like, you know, there's fine, there's numbers and people that you can look at the company growing in certain ways. Shows grow, there's more episodes, mm -hmm. the library grows. But just as a person, as a writer, how do you measure if you're growing and pushing yourself? I have to feel challenged by what I'm doing. And a lot of it is, you know, right now my, my growth, and I don't know if this counts as growth, but for me, my growth is really trying to double down on just focusing on storytelling, like double down on that and figure out what's next and what's new versus, you know, there are times when I spend a lot of time focusing on all the other things that we're doing, but really now I'm saying like, that can't happen right now. I have to really focus on that. And for me, measuring growth is, am I happy with what we did? Less than, is it successful with the public? You know, that's, that's a harder thing for me to look at as a measurement because a lot of things that we do are successful with the public, but that yes. doesn't mean that I feel like they did what I wanted them to do. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it's, you know, where where am I going creatively? Where are we going creatively? How are we growing? Is there a world in your head that you're want, or is there a world that you haven't created that you're like, that's one I want to create? There are a couple. I mean, there are a few. Like, I'd, I'd love to write a play. 
Twitch. Oh, really? Yeah, I'd love to write a play. Have you started? Are you thinking about it? I'm thinking about it. I spend a lot of time thinking about it. You know, in terms of content, I just, I'm a little obsessed with the idea of cracking science fiction in a way that makes sense to me. Interesting thinking about a science fiction show by you, because I would never imagine a Shondaland show as science, because all your shows are actually so real. They That's the thing I that draws you into, yeah. to your point. A sci-fi Shondaland show could be fantastic. I'll be I'll be waiting for it. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting to figure it out, so hopefully at some point. Thank you for coming on. I love everything you do. Love you. It's been awesome meeting you. And thank you for everything. Thank you for having me. This has been amazing. You're great.